Which which mic are you using? This one? Oh. Hello. Yeah, we're ready to start. It, it's ready. It's ready. Mm -hmm. One, one, one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Wait, 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 wait. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I think we are just about five minutes late. So in the interest of time, we would like to proceed. And we will commence with an opening prayer by Reverend Mrs. Rosemary Allen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Guide us, Lord, in all our doings with your gracious favor and further us with your continual help that, that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name and by your mercy attain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much. <coughs> Father Charles Card Reynolds, Members of the clergy, Honorable René Batiste, ladies and gentlemen, this is our second lecture in our series. Those of you who would have been here last year around this time would have remembered the lecture that was delivered by Father Reynolds on the monuments of the cathedral. Today, he will be delivering a lecture on the stained glass windows of this particular cathedral, and I am sure it will be as informative as the previous lecture, and I trust that when you leave here, you will be enriched, enriched based on what he is going to deliver. Father Card Reynolds has been commissary 
of the Diocese of the Windward Islands since 2012. He is the vicar of St. Bartholomew on Stamford Hill, Diocese of London. He is sponsored annually to visit the Windward Islands by the Fellowship of St. John, an Anglican mission and educational society, of which Father is the director. He is on the Board of Governors of St. Stephen's House, University of Oxford, and a governor of the Society for the Advancement of the Christian Faith, which has been supporting the Anglican Church in the West Indies since 1691. And at this point, I would like you to give Father Reynolds a warm Vincentian welcome. As part of the lecture today, you would be asked to come forward so that we can go and have a closer look at the stained windows. So at this point in time, I'd like to turn you over to Father Reynolds. Thank you very much for your warm welcome and it's great to be back here. Well, there's three large scale windows in the cathedral. I'm afraid if this one here is your favorite in the north transept, uh, you're going to be rather disappointed because I'm going to confine this evening's talk about the east window and this south transept window. With the east window, we will consider the maker and designer of the window, his significance in the 19th century, the iconography of the window and to whom it is dedicated. We will then move to look at this resurrection window, again considering to whom the window is dedicated, its iconography, the imagery of it, and how it came to be installed in this cathedral. I will then conclude with some closing remarks. I hope some, they will be of some practical use of where funding and an increase of uh, interest in the windows might be sought. Well, as you were hearing a few moments ago, I hope you're not sitting too comfortably because it would be worth moving up now to stand in the chancel behind me so that you can see that east window in detail. So if you'd like to come forward and gather in the chancel, please. significant patrons of the arts. Having a Kemp window in this cathedral ranks it alongside some of the most historic churches of the Anglican Communion, including York Minster, Hereford, Lichfield and Winchester cathedrals to name but few. Charles Kemp's work, his designs and the means of manufacture were so prized that for nearly 30 years after his death, his windows continued to be made. That's a, a significant way in which an artist can be honored that their work continues to be created. What then is so notable about Kemp's work? Before we come to that, 
let me say something about the man Kemp himself. He was born, as I mentioned, in the year 1837 near Brighton in southern England into a wealthy family. He was the fifth son and the youngest child. His mother was a great influence upon her family. She was an early follower of the new Anglo-Catholic movement within the Anglican Church. Charles Kemp went to Pembroke College, Oxford and felt called himself to uh, offer himself to the priesthood. However, he had a severe speech impediment and this prevented his progress to become a priest. He realized with disappointment that he would be unable to fulfill a preaching ministry because of his speech impediment. As one door seemed to close in his life, God opened another, and Kemp poured that priestly vocation into his artistic abilities. He decided if he was not permitted to minister in the sanctuary, he would use his talents to adorn it. St Augustine of Canterbury had described pictures as visual sermons, and sacred imagery from the Temple of Solomon onwards has been a way of praising God and edifying worship. Think of the countless priests and laity who have looked upon Charles Kemp's work, looked upon this particular window. Like a priest, Kemp sought to form his artistic style within the great tradition of the church. His works are not mere decoration, but works of godly witness. And he achieved that in two ways, by the content and teaching of the images, and secondly, by the superb quality of the craftsmanship. Now bear in mind this window that you're looking at was set up in 1885, and here we are standing 133 years later, and you can still see the quality of the craftsmanship that has created this window. Kemp, as a young man, studied medieval examples of stained glass. It was an art form that had been little used for over 200 years by the time that he and others of his generation rediscovered it. There is always a technical challenge with stained glass of keeping the design stable on the surface of the glass itself. We'll see later with the Prince Albert Victor window how the painted surface can easily deteriorate. Kemp, however, was a master technician. It's often said, and I'm, I'm sure you will agree with it when you look at this window, that his windows have a jewel-like quality. It was a matter of producing a large variety of strongly vivid colors, and then he was able to apply painted details to these colors that have endured, here we are, 133 years later, and this is very rare in a stained glass artist. He was a pupil under the eminent designer of his youth, notably um, George Frederick Bodley, and he also worked on projects of preservation and restoration of medieval glass. This gave him a direct link to ancient craftsmen. He worked on the windows at Fairford Church in Gloucestershire in England, which preserved miraculously from the destruction of the Reformation and the iconoclasm of the Civil War, a full set of 15th century stained glass windows. They're some of the best in Europe. And Kemp studied these, he worked on them, and he looked after them. Kemp considered that 15th century church art was the finest era of Christian iconography and this remained a strong influence in his designs. He found in the art of the High Gothic period superb artistry and a deep piety and reverence. And this is what we see in the window here. These are not only figures of Christ and his saints, but icons where we enter into their story of faith. You can sit in front of a Kemp window hundreds of times and feast on all the minute tiny details. 
And of course, one of the appeals of stained glass as an art form is that it changes with the changing light of each day. Kemp himself, coming from a wealthy family, had a personal fortune. But unlike many people of wealth of his era, he was not a man of leisure. He worked long hours himself and always kept closely in touch with the craftsmen who made the windows, the glassmakers, the artists, draftsmen, and glaziers. By the later 19th century, the art of stained glass making started to suffer from a separation of the designer and the manufacturer. But that was never the case with Charles Kemp. He was involved in every aspect of his art and its crafting. In 1869, he set up the Kemp Studios in London. The means of making a window, and it would have been the same means that would have been followed with this window, started with a commissioning conversation between the patron of the window, the person who was going to pay for it, and Kemp himself. The commission papers for this window state that it was to be formed of three lights and 72 square feet. Now, if you can see in the lower left hand, my left hand corner of the window, um, you'll see that there is some records um, that uh, about to whom the window was set up. And it reads, um, to, to, the, to the Lord or to the, um, to the honor of Jesus Christ crucified and in pious memory of George Dundas who died in Christ. And then I can't read any more of the inscription. Um, if you could see over the edge, you'll see that just at the very bottom of the window, there's a little lip that's been added to the sill and the writing disappears behind that. So if any of you are intrepid mountaineers and can get up onto the sill and look down that little lip, you might be able to see what the rest of the sentence is. George Dundas may well be a name that's familiar to you. He was the Lieutenant Governor of St Vincent from the year 1875 until his death in 1880. He had been born in 1819 of a Scottish titled family and as a young man he served in the army being stationed in Bermuda and Nova Scotia. He returned to the UK and was a Conservative Member of Parliament for Lingothgoshire in Scotland from 1847 until 1859, resigning to take up the governorship of uh, Prince Edward Island in Canada. Thereafter, he came here to St. Vincent. It'd be interesting to know who it was in 1885 who placed the commission with Charles Kemp um, in memory of George Dundas. Kemp would have agreed the subject and sketched out a cartoon. His chief draftsman, John Carter, would then have worked with other artists to put more detail onto that cartoon before it was transferred onto the glass itself, followed by cutting and leading. You'll notice in the window that the lead between the panes of glass is a way of picking out the details of, of the picture. This later manufacturing process was carried out by the glassworks foreman, the master glazier, Alfred Edward Tomlinson. Now it will take someone who is very eagle-eyed or perhaps someone with a telescope uh, to spot a particular detail on the window. It's not one that I've been able to see yet. But Kemp followed the medieval craftsman's tradition of producing his work to the glory of God. So he didn't draw attention to himself as the person who was the artist behind the window. His emphasis was on the glory of God, so he only included a tiny detail in his windows that says it was by him, and that is a little golden wheat sheaf. So if 
you spot on the window ever, that little tiny wheat sheaf, you'll know that that's Charles Kemp's signature. But in fact, he didn't always include it. He was, he often had that modesty of not wishing to draw attention to himself, but simply uh, for his work to glorify God. The transepts and chancel of this cathedral in which we now stand were built between 1880 and 1887 and this window as we've said was installed in 1885 so we can presume, presume that the architectural setting of the three lancet windows and the commissioning of the window happened all at the same time that this part of the building was being constructed. The architectural style of the chancel is inspired by 13th century forms known as Early English. Slender, we can see those three slender lancet windows bordered by narrow columns typical of the Early English. The arrangement of the window behind being those three windows is called a trinity window. And the purpose of that is to show that whatever is depicted in the window all happens within the context of the Holy Trinity. Kemp, as you will see, has filled every single part of the window with detail and colour. It is quite remarkable. Each saint, each angel, each animal face even, has its own expression. All of Kemp's designs are unique and nowhere else has a window the same as you have here at St George's. The window as a whole is formed, as you'll see, of three vertical lancets. But Kemp invites you not only to look at it uh, horizontally but also laterally. Um, in the upper horizontal, so the three figures at the top of the window, you'll see that that forms one picture, and it's a picture of the Holy Rood, Christ on the cross, accompanied by his Holy Mother Mary and the beloved disciple St. John. Above Christ, you will see the sun and moon, the sun and moon appearing together as the symbol that the crucifixion is eternal and timeless and they also appear together as a sign of creation's sorrow and groaning at the time of Christ's death. Behind the cross you will see a cloth hanging down and Kemp often used that particular motive um, and he's imitating here those 15th century depictions that he was perhaps familiar with from Fairford Church. Below Christ's feet are two ministering angels who are dressed like deacons. And this emphasizes that Christ himself is the high priest and it links Christ's sacrifice on the cross with the liturgical action of the priests below at the altar. By up above Mary's name you will see the words Marta della Rosa, Mother of Sorrow, and above St John's net is an inscription that says St John the Beloved Disciple. And we see St John at the time of the crucifixion as a young man and that contrasts if you go down the window to St John as the evangelist, uh, as an older man. Below the crucifixion, you will see uh, St Michael, St Michael the Archangel, armoured in the medieval style, shown as an angel of judgment. Christ's saving act above is God's judgment on the world. St Michael traditionally is the protector of Christians, especially those travelling at sea, so this is well chosen for St Vincent. And beneath St Michael we see the defeated devil. He carries, St Michael carries, the lance of a knight 
but the top of the lance, as you will see, is formed into a cross. Then below St. Michael, if you go down, is St. George in the traditional position of a titular image of a cathedral or church. So this is the saint after whom the uh, church is dedicated. And traditionally that was always placed above the altar which Kemp has followed here. And again Kemp has depicted him in typical 15th century style. The flag of St George behind him, the lance with which he killed the dragon is in one hand and the palm of a holy martyr is in his other hand. The dragon that St George killed, uh, which had threatened the town of Selene in Libya, lies at his feet. Now some versions of that legend say that he killed the dragon outright, others that he injured it so that the princess that he had rescued could lead it back into the nearby town like a dog on a leash and St George only slaying it when the pa pagans of Silene agreed to be baptised. A rather unusual form of evangelization, I think. And then you'll see around the edge of the window the four evangelists all appearing in canonical order, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, as active in the writing of their Gospels, all witnesses of the saving act of the cross above them. Each are accompanied by their traditional attribute, and again Kemp followed the customary medieval way of depicting and identifying each evangelist. So if we start by looking at St. Matthew, St. Matthew's symbol, his attribute just above him, is a winged man or angel. For in St. Matthew's Gospel, we trace Christ's genealogy, emphasizing both Christ's humanity and his uh, immortality. And then to St. Mark, he began his gospel with the words, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And that voice of one crying in the wilderness was likened to a lion's roar. The lion too is Christ's royal dignity. And so you'll see accompanying St. Mark is the lion. This is the lion who is at the throne of God in Ezekiel and Revelation. And then to uh, St. Luke. St. Luke's attribute is a winged ox, again a reference to the book of Revelation. The ox was a sacrificial animal, representing St. Luke's emphasis upon the sacrifice of Christ and Christ's atonement for humanity's sin. And lastly, we come to St. John. He is accompanied by an eagle, a reference to the soaring majesty and inspiration of his gospel as he teaches the divinity of Christ. And you'll see in front of St John there is an open scroll and on that scroll St John is writing Verum caro factum est, the word became flesh. The window as a whole is a meditation for us on the crucifixion and the witness of the evangelists and saints to Christ and to the good news. It was observed in the 19th century that during the Reformation the imagery of churches had been carried out through the doors, but that the Anglo-Catholics were carrying imagery back in through the windows. Kemp was very much part of this Catholic revival in Anglicanism discovering not only the designs of medieval artists, but reproducing their excellent craftsmanship as well. So just before we leave this window and go to look at the resurrection window, just a reminder to anyone who's feeling intrepid, if you can get up and see what it says about George Dundas, because it would be very interesting to know if there's the name of a donor there as well. So 
we can perhaps resume our seats, uh, but uh, hopefully you'll have a view of the uh, resurrection window. This magnificent window of the resurrection is a memorial to a member of the royal family who is often described as the king we never had. For although he was the heir to the throne, his early death at the age of 28 caused his younger brother to become our king. The window is dedicated, as it reads in the, the bottom section of the window, with the words, in memory of Albert Victor Christian Edward, Duke of Clarence and Avondale, died January the 14th, 1892. He was the eldest son of His Royal Highness Edward, Prince of Wales, the future King Edward VII and Queen Alexandria. It was Queen Victoria, his grandmother and godmother, who chose his first Christian name, Albert, after her husband, Prince Albert, the Prince Consort. Prince Albert Victor was born on the 8th of January, 1864. Uh, he was born two months premature, and he became the second in line to the throne, following his father. Queen Victoria took charge of his education. An Anglican priest, the Reverend John Dalton, who was notably a rather dull man, was appointed his personal tutor. The Queen wished to ensure that Prince Eddie, he was always known within the family as Prince Eddie, would not be influenced too greatly by his father's rather self-indulgent ways or so, the queen, uh, or so as the Queen saw them. Prince Eddie was educated alongside his younger brother, Prince George. In 1877, the two princes were enrolled as Royal Naval Cadets, and for three years they served on board the training ship HMS Britannia. And it was during their teenage years in the Navy that the two princes came to visit the West Indies. They then went on to South America, the Falkland Islands, South Africa, Australia, Fiji, Singapore, Ceylon, Aden, Egypt, the Holy Lands and Greece. It was quite a world tour that they were on. And in Japan, they both acquired tattoos in the form of red dragons, but it's not recorded what their granny, Queen Victoria, thought of that. In Australia, Prince Eddie undertook a number of more formal engagements and it was noted how unaffected he was, well able to mix with ease with everyone. Then back in Britain, the Prince continued his education at Cambridge University, attending Trinity College. It would be fair to say that he was not an academic, nonetheless, he entered into university life, especially its social and sporting aspects. And while in Cambridge, he completed his learning of the Danish language to a very high proficiency. It had been while he was in the Caribbean 
uh, visiting various islands that he had also visited the Danish West Indies. As a student in Cambridge, he started to take a more mature interest and understanding in politics and privately expressed support for the movement in Ireland for home rule. This movement for home rule sought to devolve much government from London to Ireland itself and it was much supported by the then Prime Minister William Gladstone as a way of responding to Irish grievances. A few years after the Prince left Cambridge and a year before he died, negotiations started to appoint him Viceroy of Ireland and it's really one of those great what-ifs of history. What if he, with his liberal and sympathetic views of Ireland, had been appointed? The course of Irish history might have run more smoothly. On his death, the Prime Minister Gladstone lamented, we have lost a great ally. From Cambridge, Prince Albert Victor was commissioned into the army, into the 10th, 10th Hussars, which is a cavalry regiment, and he had full responsibilities as an officer, and in time he became a captain. He occasionally fulfilled public engagements, notably in Ireland and Gibraltar, and then he went on a nine-month tour of India in October 1889. He was the first generation of the British royal family where extensive international travel and the royal presence was possible and also to some extent expected. Throughout his twenties, the question of a wife for him had been frequently raised. She would, after all, be the future Queen of England. Several women were lined up as possible brides. His first love came in 1889 with his cousin, Princess Alex of Hesse, but she did not return his affections, and she later married Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, the last Tsar. The second was an even greater love, Princess Helene of Orléans, uh, daughter of Prince Philippe, the Count of Paris, she was a Roman Catholic, and although she offered to convert, to become an Anglican, her father and the Pope would not allow it. Then Queen Victoria positioned another German princess, Princess Mary of Teck, as a possible bride. She was the daughter of the Queen's cousin. Prince Albert Victor proposed to her after a short courtship on the 3rd of December, 1891. Princess Mary said that this happened to her great surprise and the wedding was set for the 27th of February, 1892. Well, as you will see from the date on the window, the 14th of January, 1892, they never reached their wedding day. Prince Albert Victor became ill a few days after his 28th birthday while at Sandringham House. He had caught influenza, which turned into pneumonia, and he died within a few days, his parents, sisters, Princess Mary at his side. Upon his coffin, Princess Mary laid the bridal bouquet of orange blossom that she had chosen for their wedding. The Prince was buried in the Albert Memorial Chapel at St George's, Windsor. The effigy of him, dressed in his Hussar's uniform, accompanied by a kneeling angel, is considered the finest example of late 19th century sculpture anywhere in the British Isles. So splendid is his memorial that the sculptor, Alfred Gilbert, went bankrupt because of its production. He was such a perfectionist, he poured much of his own money into the production of the memorial. 
The prince's death was greeted with shock across the empire and memorial services and requiems were widely held. His mother, Princess Alexandra, commissioned Charles Kemp to produce a window depicting Prince Albert Victor in the guise of St George. Well, how is it that we have here a memorial to this particular prince? This window was originally commissioned for St Paul's Cathedral in London. I have researched in the archives of St Paul's and I've not yet been able to establish why it was that St Paul's commissioned the window in the first place. It is possible, likely, that the window was commissioned in recognition of Prince Albert Victor's membership of the Masons. Like other members of the royal family at the time, the prince was an active member of a Masonic lodge. Indeed, there had been a lodge named after him in the city of York. St Paul's Cathedral was a centre of Masonic membership too. In fact, the cathedral had its own lodge until as recently as the 1980s. And when we look at the window, we can perhaps see some strong architectural elements within it. And this would be typical of uh, Masonic imagery. In particular, we see the four columns around the resurrection. The top of those columns is what is called the composite classical style. Um, and that would certainly fit with Masonic imagery. Now, I'm very sorry, I'm not able to confirm the story that Queen Victoria refused to allow the window to be set up in the cathedral originally because of the Red Angel. That's because of a, an absence of records. The story goes, which I'm sure many of you, all of you know, that Queen Victoria would not allow the window to be installed as the Gospels record that the angel at the resurrection tomb was dressed in white, not red. It would not, shall we say, have been out of character for the Queen to take a close interest in such details. And so the story of her uh, declining this window um, certainly has a, an element of truth to it. In the lower part of the window, uh, along the bottom, uh, you will see that there are two coats of arms. Uh, on the right hand side, those are the coats of arms of the Dean of St Paul. You can see the letter D uh, depicting, uh, delineating the Dean. And then on this left hand side, uh, you will see the arms of the Diocese of London, both of both of the coats of arms being formed of the swords of St. Paul um, and his martyrdom. I've been looking at the window over the last few days and unfortunately I can't find a manufacturer or, or a designer's sign on it anywhere. So again, any of you with eagle eyes who can spot that detail uh, anywhere, a small signature or a small symbol, um, do, do please let me know. It'd be fascinating to know who the artist was. As I said, the window was never installed in St Paul's and it remained in storage in the crypt until, that is, the 1930s, when the Bishop of the Windward Islands, Dr Viber Jackson, was visiting his old friend, the Dean of St Paul's. The cathedral was very familiar to Bishop Jackson he had been a pupil at the City of London Boys' School, which is located very nearby. And it was agreed that the window should come here and be installed. Uh, you can perhaps see right above the window uh, a circle in the plasterwork. And I suspect that originally the south transept was the same as the north transept. And you can see it's got one of those round windows so I suspect that the, the wall was adapted 
uh, in order to receive the window when it arrived. And how fortunate it is that the window came to St George's. The bombing of London, which affected St Paul's Cathedral during the Second World War, destroyed all of the stained glass windows at the cathedral. And so what you have here, I think, is a unique survival of pre-war St Paul's glass. It just got out within the nick of time before the Luftwaffe started to bomb London. As you'll see of this window, it's not quite of the quality of the Kemp window uh, above the altar. Hardly any stained glass can match the work of Charles Kemp. However, there is certainly good artistry here. And we can see that uh, particularly in the architectural forms, uh, the perspective of the window is extremely good and the uh, artistry of the angel's face is very fine as well. Now I'd like to conclude with some remarks about the um, preservation and restoration of these windows. I have highlighted that the cathedral has two historically and culturally important windows, both treasures from the 19th century. You will have noticed how on both windows damage, loss and deterioration has occurred. Restoring windows is a very precise and expensive work and the Dean has whispered in my ear the eye-watering amount of money uh, that will be needed. The Kemp window, unsurprisingly, when we consider the quality of the original craftsmanship, has fared well. The most obvious loss is the face of St Michael and this could quite easily be repaired and that would return wholeness and integrity to the whole design. In the year 2000, a resume of all Kemp's work in the UK and Ireland was published. And this has certainly increased both popular and scholarly awareness and appreciation of Charles Kemp's artistry. He's much better known now as one of those leading artists of the Victorian era. And at present, uh, a second resume of all Kemp's work outside the British Isles is being written and sponsored by the Kemp Society. May I suggest to you that a series of very high quality photographs be taken of the window and sent to the Kemp Society in the UK so that the window could be illustrated in this resume of uh, work that is being produced at the moment. Such photographs would also serve as a way of alerting the Kemp Society uh, of the need of restoration. Um, they would probably also be able to advise on how that work could take place and how the window could be cared for. And it's worth bearing in mind that the Kemp Society is also a grant-making body. The windows, or details of the window, could also be easily reproduced on cathedral merchandise, which would be uh, a good way to raise funds as well. The resurrection window might attract interest um, from the present royal family. Prince Albert Victor is, after all, our Queen's great uncle. It may also be worth approaching the Freemasons in the UK and perhaps more locally as well. There may also be connections that could be made with Trinity College Cambridge, with the Hussars, and with St Paul's Cathedral. And it may be that any particular donor 
would only be able to provide just a small proportion of what is needed, but taken together, it might all add up. Prince Albert Victor has been somewhat rediscovered by academics in recent years. His memory has been too easily forgotten in that he was the king we never had. And into this lack of understanding, popular and at times sensational and lurid stories have been projected upon him. The most absurd being, and forgive me even for mentioning it, is that he has been uh, positioned as a suspect for being the serial killer, Jack the Ripper. Without doubt, that story is entirely untrue. None, nonetheless, the unfounded accusation has featured in television document, docudramas and even in a Hollywood film. Prince Albert Victor needs rescuing from such nonsense. Your window celebrates and honours Prince Albert Victor, and rightly so. There is something very contemporary about his short life. He was the first generation of the royal family to have travelled very extensively, to have had a genuine military career rather than just an honorary one, and to have attended university and to have shown compassion and understanding in his emerging political views. In his younger brother, King George V, we were well served by a principled and dutiful king. But Prince Eddie had the promise to be a good monarch too. The restoration of this window might mark something of a restoration of his memory and reputation. As I conclude then, this second lecture on the cathedral, I have been struck once more by what a significant and vital bis building this is for the preservation, celebration and inspiration of the arts in St Vincent. It is wonderful to see the progress that you are already making and I am sure that there are donors and funders that could be drawn into supporting the work further. I am totally biased, of course, but this surely is one of the most culturally important buildings of our Christian faith anywhere in the Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Reynolds. And we can spare a few questions. So for this particular session, we will allow you to ask questions. And I'm sure Father Reynolds will be happy to answer your questions. But before I start, let me also say that this particular, uh, this evening, this lecture is being broadcast live via the internet. Compliments, Cap Malcolm. And we wish to thank him very much for this. So the floor is open for questions, if anyone has a question. Um, I gather that we can use, uh, we have an additional microphone, so once we identify who is asking the question, we will pass the microphone to the person so that you can be heard clearly. All right, while you are thinking about your question or questions, I must say before this lecture, I didn't have a clue about stained glass windows. And I don't know how many of you fall in that category. But I find it very enriching, very informative. And I trust that you too would have benefited from this lecture this afternoon. So the floor is open for anybody who has a question or two. As Father Reynolds will be happy to answer your questions. Wait, before you, could you use the mic, please? 
Uh, but I would, um, I would to thank you very much on the um, lecture because um, I was born and raised in school here. Um, I just see myself as a ecologist. I like to know what's going on in my surroundings. I like to be knowledgeable about my surroundings. So um, the lecture today did feel like that because I'm a bit of a historian now. So I like to know things in a historical context. Um, the lecture was great because it showed the correlationship between art and space and time. Because um, the art I was talking about, um, it started the early modern time. And it's still with us today. Um, it, it, it big show that is very, very, very big. So um, on the behalf of the exemption and King Stonia, I want you to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I suspect that the reason why the angel is in red is uh, the choice of the artist. Because if you look at uh, the stained glass windows, there's very little uh, white, because white doesn't uh, respond well. Um, they're, it, they're nearly always shades of cream or gray that give the appearance of being white. So I suspect when the artist was producing the window, the cartoon, um, he or she would have realized that a big white angel in the middle of the window would simply not have worked and so to to change it uh, into this and red is one of the colors of the resurrection as well the resurrection flag is the same as the st george's flag white and red um, and you can see the resurrection flags right at the top of the window where there are two white angels but actually if you look at those two white angels there's not much white on them uh, at all, because it doesn't respond well to, to light behind it. But I'm sure that there is a story behind it, um, and certainly a story to the umbrage that Queen Victoria might have uh, taken uh, to the imagery. Um, and in recent years, I think it was from uh, 2014 onwards, Queen Victoria, who wrote an extensive journal every day, the royal family have placed that journey online and it's accessible to academics. Um, well, if you've got about five years to read it, <laughs> there it is for you to be able to access. But I mean, you can, you can re reference different aspects of the, of the journal. And it'd be interesting to know whether around the time uh, of the prince's death um, or when it was proposed for uh, St Paul's, whether there's any reference in her journal uh, to uh, her views on it. Do we have any, any other questions or comments?
So I think it's a fact that seven years ago, when we realized that something stayed last week was um, deteriorating, we inquired and we referred to Canterbury. Canterbury told us then that there were two Barbarian lads who were trained in staying last week and we were and got hold of them, drinking up the day. We turned home and they came and stayed with us in the evening for six weeks. Three weeks and then another three weeks. And they repaired all of this in last week. Took away parts to Barbados and um, restored them and so on. Because stones from the plane, boys play, I suppose girls do, grow Barbados from time to time. And then two boys repaired them. And then all of the saints came alive. Thank you, and congratulations in advance. Okay. Okay, your, your silence tells me that um, you have enjoyed it, but perhaps you don't have a question or a comment at this particular point in time. And if that is the case, I will have to move on. So I will, I will pause for a couple of seconds and see if someone has a question before, before I move on. Okay. We will then proceed with the rest of the program. And uh, I will now call on the Honorable René Batiste for the closing remarks. Father Charles, Reverend Smith, I think the Dean left. Oh, oh he's there. he was down here. My brothers and sisters, once again it is my distinct pleasure to thank Father Charles for this excellent lecture that he delivered here in relation to the stained glass windows in our cathedral. And I was indeed more heartened when he said that this cathedral is the most culturally important buildings in the Caribbean. This building has been declared a protected national heritage under the laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And when something is a protected national heritage, it cannot be defaced or destroyed without certain penalties attached to it. Of course, we have not um, in this part here, but in other parts of the world that has consequences. The Peace Memorial Hall, the police barracks, the parliament building, are also protected national heritage, as well as the Carnegie Public Library. And one of the important essences of a protected national heritage is this. For example, the Carnegie Public Library. Persons used to refer to it as the library or the public library. But you have to maintain buildings and objects fixed within their historical place. And things, that is why things are called history. There's a story attached to it. And in the case of Carnegie, he had this, he's a philanthropist. So doing this library, it's a hundred and how much years now? Nine, it's 109 years old. 
and it's only the persons who were really interested. I was told when I served as minister, or oh, our politicians always come and say they're going to do. And they don't. I tell them the difference with me is that I love history and I love what I'm doing. So we moved about to declare them protected national heritage. And at the time, stamp issue was prepared. I don't know how many people bought stamps. And these are very important things. And we, we have not yet learned or been exposed to how important it is when you have these buildings of that quality. And it has, when you go uptown, you see those same four pillars. Inside the Carnegie building and outside the Carnegie building. And you see where the cornerstone is resting and who rested the cornerstone, the Freemasons. I'm glad that you drew that to attention. There are a lot of symbols in all of the stained glass windows that carry a history. Further, I just returned from Panama, where I was invited by UNESCO to attend a meeting of a UNESCO committee called Memory of the World. What do you think qualifies as something that is a memory of the world? something that the world should not lose, something the world had to look, look towards. So in that UNESCO body, it's divided into regions, Latin America, Caribbean, Asia and Pacific, Africa, Europe, North America, and Caribbean. Three things came out of that meeting. One, we have to think of climate change issues, which is concerning buildings of historical importance, and that could be listed as memory of the world. And I'll tell you what's in Vincent are listed. Two, we have to look at disaster risk management issues. The gentleman from Japan reminded everyone what happened with the tsunami. Nobody had in their mind that a wave over 60 feet would come in from the sea and what it will take and the importance of documenting everything that you have because the essence of the work that we were doing in Panama had to do with documentary heritage. So they have asked that we all try to document as much as possible and put it away in your archives, your documentation center because one day, kick on Jenny might decide to kick. And they say when she kicks, it will go more than 40 feet high, the wave. And the wave will come in as far as Richmond Hill, Plainfield. Just think of what you would, could possibly lose when that happens. The African nations, of course, reported that they have lost so much because when governments change and so on, they decide they don't want to hear this man's name anymore, so they burn everything in his name. And you lose that. So the next generation only know it by word of mouth, because some of the, the libraries, they even take and burn them. In St. Vincent, and in, in, in the Caribbean generally, they started to do quite a bit of work in relation to memory of the world. And I'm happy to say that some of you may recall that um, the register of Indian immigrants who arrived here in St. Vincent was rescued by my nosy self asking the registrar if she ever saw any old books in the vault at the registry. And there are a lot of old things in St. Vincent, you know, you have to just go and dig them out in a couple of dungeons here too. And that's where we found the Indian Register. At the back of the Indian Immigrant Register are Portuguese listed who arrived in St. Vincent. We also rescued the African Immigrant Register. If you can think, there were Africans who came to St. Vincent voluntarily. The Indian Register had to be restored because after it was rescued and we told the persons of Indian extraction, everybody wanted to find their names. 
So the pages started to disintegrate. Thank Trinidad and Tobago for restoring it for us. That register has now been listed as part of the documentary heritage under the memory of the world. As simple as that. So I want us to get an appreciation of what history has left for us. Because if you do, sometimes you don't know the, there are different aspects to history, but you don't destroy it all. After all, they had two world wars and the Colosseum is still leaning there. And it'd been there before Christ was born. It's still there. So we want to keep our cathedral there. Just to notify you that we've written to the Lord Bishop for permission to do postcards of the stained glass windows, towels of the stained glass windows, mats. You know, you can do the, the drawings of mats, table mats or cloth mats so that we will have souvenirs to sell because every time you go to St. Paul's or those cathedrals, there's a little shop where they're selling things. And we even took the initiative to ask the Ministry of Tourism for some training for those who are interested to be tour guides during the cruise season so that when visitors come, they can speak with authority about the cathedral and not just, well, up here is the top of the altar. You have to use the correct language because every science and every art has its language. And we have to use the language because you don't have the person coming off the boat, works in the library at Trinity. And then they look at you like you're kind of funny. So you have to know what you're, you're talking about. Those um, matters are with the bishop. There are two merchants in St. Vincent who have indicated their willingness to see about the quantities for importation. You know, we can't import 500 of something. You have to import in fairly big quantities. Even for them to get somebody to run off towels, baptismal towels with the font. Miss Erica McIntosh took out some detailed pictures. Those are the ones that I sent to you. Came from Erica McIntosh. And she took out some detailed photographs of the font, the eagle, this pulpit. So we're now doing some research. You see all that beautiful work on the outside there, that craftsmanship. We want to make sure that that is culturally, remain culturally correct. So Father Charles, thank you again for awakening and reawakening interest and sincerely hope that the progress can be done and we, we do it in accordance with what is the established practices in this particular area. And uh, I know there are anxieties to do certain things, but we have to do them in the correct way and the correct fashion. Just to let you know, Father Charles, as well, that in 2011, I took upon myself to list all the persons who have been awarded CMG in St. Vincent because after my investor at Buckingham Palace, the secretary of the Central Chancery of the Knighthood, we sort of kicked it off very well. So he always asked me to indicate who persons who are knights or holders of CMGs, if they died and who would, um, so they can send cards, etc. So that um, I'm thinking of, as you raise this, because we're only doing this by greetings and things like that, he would send to tell me when they're going to Malta to go and visit if we would like to have a trip of persons from the Caribbean to go. So I can ask him to put me in touch with the St. Paul's Cathedral and Trinity in relation to this particular window and what assistance and support we can get for that. I know the Canadian people have already indicated their willingness to give assistance to Canadian churches, which are Anglican churches, and they do this work all over the world to give assistance. So thank you for that one in relation to the UK because um, our People's Warden has been um, trying to make contact with some other cathedrals, and I myself have been 
trying to make some contact. Um, there's an association that is looking at funds, certain funds, how they'll be able to give the grants to continue the restoration. And we would like to see it restored to its beautiful glory. Those of us of the generation in the 1950s, because you had to be obedient little boys and girls, would stand when the archdeacon would be telling you the story about the red angel. So we, we carry on that same tradition that we were told she didn't like it because the angel was wearing red. I think, you know, the little fable. But those are the things that are wrong, those stories and those fables is how you build. It's just the fables about the night St. George. Are they dragons? Are they real? But they still create a mystery for us in our communion. Thank you very much, Father Charles. Thank you very much, Ms. Matisse. And we have now come to the end of this afternoon's lecture. But before we go, we want to make sure that you go peacefully. So we are now call on the Dean of the Cathedral, Dean of St. George's Cathedral, the very Reverend O. Samuel Nichols for the closing prayer. Let's all stand. The Lord be with you. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, who manifests thyself to the church in symbols such as the cross and stained glass, to the end that as often as we look upon them with the eyes of the body, so often contemplate with the eyes of memory their deeds and holiness, we may imitate the same as we think foremost of your Son, Jesus Christ, that whoever looks upon these pictures, these paintings, may by the blessing of Jesus Christ obtain grace, and in the world to come, glory everlasting. This is our prayer through Christ our Lord. And as you prepare to go to your several homes, May the peace of God which passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you very much. You are now dismissed. And thank you for coming.